Welcome to the Damcasters, brought to you in association with the Pima Air and Space Museum. I'm your host, Matt Bowen. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to the Damcasters. And we are returning this week to the Pima Air and Space Museum because in our last video, we had a rummage around the archive and the chap holding the camera was Joe Welding. And Joe, we've had on the show ages ago talking about the future of aircraft and we argued about why or whether or not it's going to be hydrogen. I'm not sure I won that argument, but I still believe in hydrogen. But Joe is an aircraft designer, and at the Pima Air and Space Museum is the first aircraft that he worked on as a designer. But before we get into that, we've got to do the sponsor bit. And throughout this video, Joe and I are both wearing fabulous t-shirts from 909 Apparel. If you've seen me in the real world, you will know that I love a great aviation theme t-shirt and hoodie. Yet finding decent quality ones has been more of a difficult process than I would have hoped for. That is, of course, until I found the fab 909 apparel. Named after the famed B-17 Flying Fortress, which flew 140 missions without losing a crew member, 909 Apparel's designs celebrate the history and heritage of aviation, which is something I can totally get behind. Each design can take up to three months of research to complete, so that you know that your passion for aviation is matched by the team at 909. And the great thing is you can get your 909 Apparel t-shirt or hoodie just about wherever you are watching this, all through their Amazon shops. So do check out their link tree below to find your local store and get your aviation on. And yes, they do Spitfire ones as well. Check out the link in the description below. So the Adam A500 was an interesting aircraft from the early 2000s with a push-pull configuration and was made out of carbon fiber, sort of arriving at the same time as the Cirrus aircraft. So to grab Joe and spend a bit of time walking around the A500, and understanding what went into the design of the aircraft was an opportunity we couldn't miss. So, hope you enjoy the video. We'll be back at the end to do some housekeeping, but I've got to say thanks to my wife, Wendy, for holding the camera and putting up with us. And thanks to Joe for letting me stand in the shade. It was hot and I burn. So here we are at the fabulous Pima Air and Space Museum, and we're gonna be looking at this aircraft, which is the Adam A500, with someone with a bit of a personal connection with it. The superb, Joe Wilding, who's been on the show before. Joe, how did you get roped into working on this? Yeah, so in the late 90s, I was working for one of Burt Rutan's companies called Scale Technology Works in Colorado. That company was starting to go through some changes, so a couple of us were looking for a, a new project to work on, and this one emerged in Denver, started by a gentleman named Rick Adam, um, hence the Adam Aircraft name. Mm -hmm. And so a good friend of mine was the first employee there, and he hired me right after that. He, he, that. His name was Dennis, he was the chief engineer, so I was the third employee there, and basically was there from the very early conception of this airplane through getting it built, the first one built, and getting through certification and into early deliveries. So 2000 through 2008, this was basically my whole life, was this airplane, <laughs> yep. So we're gonna talk about the aircraft, but we're also gonna just talk about the design fundamentals that go into mm -hmm. an aircraft. So. What was the pitch for this aircraft that you guys were starting from? Because, yeah, employee number three, you would have been there with the blank whiteboard and yeah. everybody trying to figure out what the hell you're doing. Yeah, exactly. So anytime you build a new airplane, there's there has to be a pitch. Or like, <laughs> what, what, why is this new airplane you want to build better than what's come before? And, and why should someone invest money in developing mm -hmm. that? Because airplanes take a lot of money to get through development. So this was early 2000s. Composites in uh, small aircraft was a very new thing. So the, the Cirrus line of, of four-play single engine airplanes had, had just gotten certified. That technology hadn't really risen up through other models yet. So Rick Adams saw a hole in the market to basically revolutionize twin engine aircraft, twin engine personal aircraft with modern composites and basically improve the performance and the, I'll just call it the sexiness of airplanes. And, and we'll talk about aesthetics a little more in a minute, but um, aesthetics and sexiness does sell airplanes. And there's a lot you can do with composites that's harder to do with traditional aluminum construction. Yep. So this that was one of his big selling points. So it's an all carbon airplane, um, carbon, carbon fiber fabric, pre-preg airplane. 
and uh, the other part of it was the the center line thrust um, yeah. and the the magic there is so twin engine aircraft typically have an engine about right here on the wing um, one on each wing it works great under normal conditions if you lose an engine the whole airplane wants to yaw if you're flying fast enough that's not an issue if you get down below a minimum speed which is called the minimum control speed this the airplane can essentially yaw so far that it transverses into a spin which is essentially unrecoverable right. so a lot of old twins from the um, 60s and 70s are often referred to as doctor and lawyer killers <laughs> because those are the not to pick on them but those are the type of people that could afford those airplanes they weren't necessarily as trained as highly as professional pilots yep. and and a lot of a lot of accidents in that class so centerline thrust solves that problem you lose an engine you're still a symmetric flying airplane and it essentially you have less thrust and less performance but it doesn't fly any differently so you can usually get back to the airport and, and land safely so that was the other big draw on this configuration and a lot comes out of that. Obviously, you have a motor at the front, motor at the back. Then you can't have a traditional aft fuselage or tail, so you've got to basically come up with another way to get the tail on the airplane. So you come up with this twin tail boom design, which gets the tail around that aft propeller and back far enough to where it, it, it is where it needs to be. Because mm. you can want to get clean airflow over it, but not enough turbulence off the propeller to cause issues with handling. Right, right. Okay. So when you guys were setting out on this, was it carbon from the outset or was that a decision that came a bit later? It was carbon from the outset. Um, I think that decision was made by Rick before I ever showed up. Okay. And he was he was pretty enamored by what Cirrus was in the process of pulling off with the SR-20 mm -hmm. and saw that as the future. And then uh, the, the two of us that first started there, myself and my friend Dennis, Composites was our background. So okay. hiring us specifically would very much fit into that, that idea. Okay. Yeah. So... Should you talk us around it and we yeah, can, we can yeah. start seeing where, where things are and why? Because we were talking about wingtips and wingtip shape yeah. on the Hustler yesterday. Yep. Why there's certain elements on this aircraft and why they're there? Because nothing goes onto an aircraft that isn't there for specific performance reasons. So That's right. It's going to be great to talk to you to start picking some of these things yeah, up. Yeah, yeah. So, so maybe we'll start with just kind of an overview of what does it take to design and, and, and develop a brand new airplane from scratch. Yeah. So I like to think of there's four kind of phases you have to go through from initial idea in order to get to something like this to market, meaning it's ready to sell, sell to customers, you can go mass produce them. The first one I'll kind of call stage zero because it actually happens before a new airplane like this comes mm -hmm. out. And that's what I'll call technology development. So many aircraft, many new aircraft are being built because there's something new available. Okay. Whether it's a new engine, a new material in this case, so carbon fiber um, composites, uh, maybe it's new avionics, some new system, maybe some new weapon system as a military airplane. So you'll usually develop that first um, before you even start on the airplane and know what it is, what it's capable of, and so forth. Okay. In this case, there wasn't much there. These engines were already certified. The propellers were the same. Again, the material was kind of new, but it wasn't like we developed this material. Mm -hmm. It was available, but, yep. but it did enable us to be the first to build an airplane like this out of this material. So once you have that, the next stage is you've got to build the airplane. You've got to design and build an airplane that can actually fly. <laughs> and, and that's not as easy as it sounds. Uh, actually, getting an airplane in the air is not that hard. But getting it in the air safely and getting it in the air where it's going to meet all the requirements for like handling qualities and stuff, a lot of effort goes into that and a lot of testing. So that's kind of your first chunk, and that usually takes couple years, maybe less if it's a really simple airplane, but at least a couple years. It can take many years if, if there's problems you've got to fix and so forth. So that's kind of step one. Step two is you got to get it certified. So yep. you've got to go through a whole uh, set of testing and reports and analysis and, and, and basically proving to the regulatory authority, whether that's the FAA or the EASA in, in Europe, mm -hmm. that the airplane is a safe airplane on, on every front and it's, it's worthy of being sold to customers. So yep. that's step two. Step three is then you've got to be able to build it, um, manufacture it in a way that's producible at a profit. <laughs> <laughs> All three of those stages, again, after technology development, are really hard. Um, and they're really separate. They're really separate phases that are somewhat mm -hmm. different engineers. Sometimes the same engineers and the same staff and the companies will go through all three of those phases, but they tend to be different skill sets to do to do each of those. So, okay. so and each of those takes on the order of two or three years. So all in, you're probably talking at least a four or five year program, and it could be up to 10, depending on how things go and the complexity. Mm -hmm. so, 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 so to me as a layman, it's pretty. Yeah, and yeah, I, yeah, and yeah. I guess aesthetics, as you said, come into it because that makes it saleable. But from very much so, from the design perspective, if you are, take us round it. Yeah, and yeah, yeah. Talk us through the pretty. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I will say one of the things I'm proud of: every shape you see here, 
I, I created on this airplane. So I personally <laughs> did all of the modeling, all the external, what we call lofting in, in aviation or surfacing of this whole airplane. And nowadays there's a lot of specialists that do that. And I would say they do it a lot better than I do, but this is one of the things I'm kind of proud yeah. of this airplane is, is doing that. So, so yeah, you can start with the fuselage. Um, there's little details. Again, aesthetics are, are really important. A few things on here I'll point out that I'm not proud of, but, <laughs> but in general, it's a pretty good looking fuselage uh, in whole aircraft actually. So one of the things composites gives you, if you look kind of at the fuselage shape here, there's really no straight line on it. So that upper surface and the lower surface, everything is ever curving, mm -hmm. which is one of the things that makes an airplane really aesthetic looking. Uh, P-51 Mustang is a good yeah. example. It's, it's uh, certain aspects of a Spitfire yeah. as yeah. well. Strong, strong, simple curves. Yeah. yeah, yep. And aluminum airplanes, you can get that, hence the Mustang, but you've got you've to be mass producing an airplane to be able to afford the tooling that you have to stamp the, the sheet metal parts out to get that done. So most, if you look around the museum here, most of the aluminum airplanes, like the top of that fuselage would be a straight line. Mm -hmm. And it would have all kinds of rivets on it and just chunkier, more awkward shapes. You can't get these nice flowing shapes. So that's kind of number one, um, is what you can do with the, the external shape. Things like windows, um, window proportions, how you know certain lines match, and, and that sort of thing is another big one. Uh, if you look at the engine cowling here, you, you've, as an engineer, you've got a lot of leeway, like what shape are these inlets? Um, how do they blend together? So things like that, you know, we chose a round shape here, which was kind of the, the in thing at the time, probably still is. But the way like these surfaces all blend together, all of that comes together into making a, a good looking airplane. Okay. Um, and from a performance aspect as well. Yeah, yeah. What, so what, what are you looking for with these sorts of shapes leading, keeping that gentle curve all the way going through? Yeah, so actually that's a good one to talk about. One of the things I'm less proud of on this one. So <laughs> engine cooling. So this is a 350 horsepower air-cooled engine, one in the front, one in the back. So 700 horsepower total. Um, cooling on these big um, engines, which are not big by World War II standards, but by civil standards, that's a pretty large engine for today. You've got to get a lot of cooling air through that engine. And so all of the air is coming through these two two openings here. Mm -hmm. And then it's exiting right down here. Okay. Um, there's a balance there though, and, and that's the other thing I was gonna point out is everything on airplane design and build is is a balance or a compromise. Yeah. <laughs> you wanna get just the right amount, but not too much and not too little. And cooling is a perfect example of that. If you don't get enough, the engine overheats um, on takeoff and on climb. If you get too much, it's producing extra drag. Okay. Um, so you always wanna be balancing that. So if you look at the exit here, this is actually a good example. Um, this exit, if you come around the backside, you can see how large this is. This exit started at about half this size, and we had cooling issues. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I should also point out this airplane itself is serial number four. So it was one of our first ones built, not the very first, but an early one. And so we were having cooling issues, so we had to make that exit larger. I actually think it's really ugly in its current, <laughs> current <laughs> status. The plan eventually was to make that movable, like a lot of higher performance uh, piston engine airplanes have. So when it's on the ground or when it's in cruise, it's much smaller. Uh, but we didn't get to that point. Again, this being an early version, okay. um, so it was just fixed. So creating more drag than it needs to didn't actually have that much effect on the performance, but I think it's really ugly <laughs> being that big. So, uh, but yeah, so that's a good, a good example of, of that balance that you, you get into in, in, in aircraft design. Okay. And you're, you talk about that everywhere on the airplane, whether it's weight, whether it's uh, like wing area is another good one. So the, the size of the wing is really important. If it's not large enough, you can't fly slow enough to basically take off on a normal runway because the, the faster you have to fly before you can go airborne, the longer runway you need. So you need a nice big wing to be able to get the stall speed low enough to be able to take off. Once you're in the air and flying fast, and this airplane had a cruise speed up to 250 knots, okay. uh, which is reasonably yeah. fast for a piston-powered airplane, you don't need a very big wing. You're going so fast and there's so much airflow over it, you can get by with a much smaller wing. And the bigger your wing, the, the more drag it produces and it's gonna limit that top speed. So there's a very much a trade-off there between those two. Of what kind of runways do you wanna use and how fast do you wanna go? And I guess, again, speed comes down to being able to sell it. Yes, exactly, yeah. exactly. Yeah. yeah, if you're a really slow business aircraft, nobody's going to buy it because yeah. the whole point is to be able to beat what you can do in a car, essentially. Yeah. And at 250 knots, you can start to make some pretty real trips that are very much faster than driving in a car. Whereas at 100 miles an hour of a slower airplane, it's hard to argue, just, just yeah. go drive. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, 
back to style or aesthetics again, the winglet. People love winglets. <laughs> so this, this, this is an interesting story. So the original airplane did not have a winglet like this. They, they serve multifunction. One is they, are, they do look good. For yeah. whatever reason, most people think a winglet makes an airplane look, look faster at least or, or be faster. They do, if they're properly designed, they do reduce drag a tiny bit, but it's probably hard to even measure with a winglet of this size, yeah. and this is very small. Mm -hmm. You can see modern airliners, like the modern 737s have a winglet that's probably six or eight feet mm -hmm. tall, and those start to make at least a couple percent difference, which okay. is still not a lot, but airliners, yeah. they it's, fight for any percent yeah. they can get. So this one is there. There's actually another reason for it, back to compromise and balance. Aesthetics was one of them, but there's another one. There's a rule, at least here in the U.S., that the Environmental Protection Agency has put out that if you're an airplane sitting on a ramp on a hot day, it cannot spill fuel on the ground. Right. So, so for, for environmental reasons, obviously. So if you fill up the tanks on a cold day and day gets hot, that fuel expands. It'll often, on old airplanes, spill out of a vent that's down here in the wingtip. So one way to solve that is you can put a valve, a little float valve, that prevents that from happening. Problem with float valves is they're uh, prone to failure. So often they'll get stuck and then you can damage the airplane um, when you climb up or, or over pressurize the wing essentially. Yeah. So the way this is solved, and we didn't invent this, some other companies have done this. There's actually a vent line that goes up inside this wing tip and comes back down. And so that, what that does is uh, as the airplane is like sitting on a crooked ramp, it's gotta be really crooked before that fuel can run up this high and come back down and spill out. So that's the primary reason this <laughs> wing tip is here. But the market people loved it. They're yeah. like, oh yeah, do that. We'll sell more of these and we can charge more for the airplane with it on there. <laughs> so wing design is always one of those things that fascinates me because it's sort of one of those proprietary things that you rarely, unless you're talking about new Boeing aircraft, see companies give away. Uh -huh. We talked about the shape of the fuselage. When it comes to the airfoil, what goes into getting this shape right yep. for again, balance between performance yeah, yeah. and speed and all those good things. Yeah, so most fast airplanes, you know, business jets um, and above will have a bespoke designed airfoil specifically for that airplane. Mm -hmm. And not only is it an airfoil, it might have 10 different airfoils that yep. they're designing along the span of the wing. Most airplanes of this class don't go to that level of detail because you really don't need to. Okay. Um, the extra performance you're going to get out of that is, is minor. So this is actually an airfoil that's called a... a an LS-1, I think, which was a NASA-designed airfoil. It actually is a laminar flow airfoil, much like the Mustang had. So it's hard to see with the wingtip on here, but the max thickness of this airfoil is back here somewhere, okay. like most laminar, airfoil, laminar flow airfoils are. This airplane, if you look at this leading edge, you know, there's little screw heads here, there's a step here. We probably weren't getting much laminar flow out of this, just like most laminar flow airplanes. Probably a little bit, but probably not a lot. But that airfoil in itself is just a good overall balanced airfoil not only for low drag, but also good stalling characteristics yeah. and so forth. One thing I will point out that's kind of an interesting, and I'm actually, I'd forgotten this, I'd surprised this, this feature is not actually on this airplane. So this being an early one, I think this was meant to be upgraded before the company went out of business. Airplanes have to produce low drag and, and produce lift, but they one of the main things they have to do is when they do stall, they have to stall in a very predictable way. Yep. And as we all know what stall means is you get down slow, your angle of attack, I should do relative to the airplane here, is coming up and at some point the air flowing over the top separates and when that separates your lift starts to decrease and sometimes very rapidly, other times in a, in a slow controlled way. You want the slow controlled way. And the main thing you're looking for out of a stall is you want it to stall at the root first and the reason and then progress outboard because if it stalls down here and then slowly goes out that better controls the, the time that's happening and the pilot can react mm -hmm. most importantly where you're standing where the aileron is at you always want this section of the wing to have attached flow because then your aileron still works so as you're stalling the pilot can still keep the airplane level yeah. and if it stalls out here that's when you get into a spin that's usually unrecoverable. Mm -hmm. So, and you, it, the feel to the pilot gets progressively more. So yes. when, when you're getting to about here, you can feel it yeah, yeah, much yeah. more in the stick shape. Yep. Yeah. And so this airplane actually has, I think this one does, yeah, it's almost impossible to see, but there's a subtly different airfoil right here with the leading edge drooped down just a little bit mm -hmm. to make it not stall at, at, out, out here. Mm -hmm. What we determined in flight test was it wasn't enough. We needed more of that effect. So what we did is we took this section of this leading edge, made a new one that actually drooped down even more um, and replaced this and then it worked great. And that's an example of changes you make during the certification program. So the original design, we probably flew it for two or three years like that. It flew fine, 
but it was a little bit sketchy on the stall and through certification flight test that needed to be changed to make it safe enough for the general public to fly. Yeah, so, so it, it's one it's one thing having a test pilot do it, it's another exactly. thing having a yeah. doctor or a lawyer. A do doctor it. or a lawyer. Yeah. Not to pick on them. <laughs> I should say an engineer as well. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, here's another one. So this this lead this straight down here. You'll see things like this on airplanes all the time, um, in various shapes and sizes and whatever. This was to correct um, the a, a directional instability of the airplane. And so at at high side slips, the vertical tails were not reacting quite as well as they should have in order to meet the, the uh, certification requirements. So this is a relatively thin blade essentially that sticks down. It's kind of like a strake on a fighter or something like that. That basically, when you're at a high yaw, there's a big vortex that sheds off of here and it tries to help right the airplane to, to go in the right direction again. And things like this, like this part weighs like a pound or something. And so without changing the whole rest of the airplane and the tooling that you build in the manufacturing process, you just make this one other piece and you glue it on and you're done. <laughs> so you'll see if it's one of the things I love about air museums, you can go find little details like this that aren't necessarily obvious when you're just looking at a picture online or in a book. Mm -hmm. And there's always a reason for this kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. um, see, yeah, so it, it's not there to either look good or because it had an extra bit of metal. It's there. It's there for, for some reason. reason yeah. But, yeah. We're going to take a quick break to pop to the Pima Air and Space Museum to visit with Director of Collections Andrew Bailey and find out about one of the aircraft in the incredible Pima collection. Today we're going to talk about one of my favorite aircraft, the Vought F4U Corsair. The Corsair is most famous for being a Navy and Marine Corps fighter in World War II in Korea. It's my favorite aircraft because as a kid I would watch reruns of Black Sheep Squadron on the television. It was one of the first model kits I ever put together as well. To this day, I remember seeing my first Corsair in a museum and seeing a first one fly at an air show. It's left such an indelible mark in my memory. This aircraft itself was built by Vought Aircraft in Dallas, Texas, and was delivered to the US Navy in August of 1945. It served with various Navy fighter and training squadrons until 1956 when it was retired and sold to a private owner. In 1979, it was sold to the Marine Corps Heritage Program and loaned to the Pima Air and Space Museum that same year. You might have noticed the gall shape of the wing. This was a solution to a design problem. The gall shape of the wing allowed for shorter landing gear while also giving ground clearance for the propellers. This is a Pratt & Whitney R2800, the same engine that's in the Corsair. We hope you enjoyed this video. And thank you for letting me talk about one of my favorite aircraft. To find out what's going on at the Pima Air and Space Museum and to see the incredible collection that they have, please visit www.pimaair.org for more information and be sure to give them a follow via all the links in the description to this episode. And now back to the show. So you mentioned gluing it on. So I guess with the composite aircraft, you're using techniques that the majority of people with a traditional idea of rivet and steel and rivet and aluminium. How much of this can be baked in one go? So, um, yes, yeah, a great question. Um, essentially, all the parts you see here, so the fuselage, the, the tail booms, the wings, are all made in generally two, two major pieces. So the, the fuselage is split down the center line. So there's a, a left and a right half that come together like this with a joint. And those are uh, glued, uh, bonded is the term we typically <laughs> use in the industry. I just say glued, so yeah. either one. But bonded using a, a paste adhesive. So those are bonded together. There's a secondary joint that's put on the inside of there so it's redundant to give it additional strength. So that's the way the fuselage is made. These tail booms are the same way. Right in the middle of here, there's a joint, upper and lower. Those come together, they get body worked over so once you have it done you cannot see them and there's no drag that comes out of that yeah um, but so that's that the wings there's an upper skin and a lower skin and then inside there's spars and, and ribs so mm -hmm. inside the wing it looks similar to a aluminum construction airplane but instead of it being all bolted or riveted together it's 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 bonded okay and large airplanes large composite airplanes like 787 are typically more fastened together um, when you get to a larger scale the strength of those bond lines doesn't scale quite as well for as mm -hmm. for an airplane this size I want to just get to that sort of push-pull configuration again we talked about it being safer for that what design issues did that give you to, to get through because I guess you can't really rely on too much more because oh, goodness I'm trying to think there's only a few aircraft yeah there's not many the, the Piper or Cessna had one uh, Cessna had Cessna. the 337 yeah. that was probably the most successful yeah. um, for the same reasons like mm -hmm. it was a very safe airplane so the couple challenges with it um, let's get around here yeah let's go around one is the 
um, the we talked about cooling on the front propeller. Yep. Cooling on the aft is even harder. Um, so here's here's the exit on the aft. It ends up being about the same size as up front. And actually, there's a couple of auxiliary exits we put. I think the oil cooler might be down there. Um, the inlets on the on the back are here. Yep. Because it's so far back on the fuselage, it's not getting as clean of air into those inlets as the front gets being right there and having a propeller in front of it. So these are actually larger than they are on the front. And ironically, most pusher aircraft have problems with cooling that engine in the back. Mm -hmm. We knew that was a problem. We put a lot more effort into getting the back engine cooled. And because of that, we had less problems. We never expected to have problems on the front, <laughs> but it's such just the way it goes. <laughs> So that's, that's, cooling is probably the hardest one. It is a different propeller because it's a pusher propeller instead of a tractor, but it's essentially the same. It's got a little bit different blade twist to it. Is it the same engine in both? Same, same engine in both. So yep. what, what complicates that? Because B36 famously, yep. they just put normal engines in a, in a pusher configuration and it overheated to, yeah, to yeah. What considerations do you have I'm guessing gearbox, again, cooling, things like that you're having to yeah, it's really, a different. Really, the cooling is the only difference. Okay. Um, it is literally the same engine front and back. It's just turn, turned around backwards. Okay. So um, the, the other problem with this configuration, and we didn't have too much of a problem with this airplane, but a little bit. The Cessna 337 very much had this problem. It was probably its biggest problem is noise. Yeah. So when you have a, uh, an engine on both sides of a fuselage, and this is a pressurized airplane as well. So you've got this big, heavy pressure bulkhead at the back of the cabin. That pressure bulkhead tends to act like a drum. Okay. When you have an engine on the back side of it, and it tends to do and this and it makes a really loud airplane. We knew that as well. Um, one of the advantages we have being carbon fiber and there's honeycomb core in, in the parts to stiffen them, <laughs> that actually is a very good sound deadening material. So just because we had that as a pressure bulkhead as opposed to thin aluminum on the Cessna, yeah. uh, that helped us a lot. So this airplane wasn't quiet by any means. Piston engine airplanes typically aren't, but it was not really any more loud than a, a traditional twin. So. so so what were you able to take off the Cessna when you were doing your design brief on it? Because I, I guess you would look at similar aircraft and yep. see w issues like that and see how you could minimize it. So did you do a, a sort of case study on the Cessna? For sure. Yeah, yeah. yeah. In fact, um, the owner of the aircraft of the company, Rick Adam, used to own a Cessna 337. <laughs> so it doesn't get any better than yeah. that. So he owned one at one point and flew that for several years. So you know, he was a firsthand user of that airplane and knew its, its little subtle uh, subtle things that he wanted to improve Rick, on. Write down everything you like and everything that you hate. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Yep. Interestingly, where the twin booms meet the wing, very blended, how does that affect the aerofoil in itself? Because, you know, you look at, say, P-38, it's sitting on top, so mm -hmm. it's got clean airfoil in this. Yep. With yours, you're sort of joining, I guess, three quarters of the way up the boom. Yep. What does that do to, to your design of the airfoil on it? Because you, to a layman, you can say, well, you're interrupting airflow on that because you're splitting yeah, yeah. it around the boom. Yep. Yeah, so it's a great question as well. Um, on an airplane like this, so most of the lift comes out of the fore part of the, of the wing. So, and the whole wing is important, of course, but if you look at like a pressure distribution of a wing like this, it peaks up really high at the leading edge and then kind of tapers off. So what you do back here on a wing is less important than what you're doing at the very front. So okay. you, you most, probably can't see yeah, it here. Because most the leading edge is where you're gonna be producing. Lift. Exactly. Yeah. And so a boom like this will somewhat interrupt the airflow span wise on a wing but not tremendously and especially at these kind of speeds mm -hmm. if you were getting up to you know high transonic mach numbers like a p38 it might be much more important so the next thing you want to look at so so that's kind of the first first order answer the second thing you want to look at is what's called interference drag and so this right here so this is called a, a, a fillet yep. and so you can see and this is a very ugly example <laughs> another <laughs> thing you know this thing just being an early airplane, these parts did not fit very well. And over time, we tweaked them and got them a little better. But what you don't want from a drag standpoint is you don't want square corners. So if this wing just came and intercepted this and this was square, you would get a lot of drag right in that square corner, much higher than what the, the parts would have any, uh, so, otherwise. And is, so that, I, is that incidental drag when you're creating this? Am I remember that right? I'm trying to go back to, to school for that. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a version of, of parasite drag. Parasite drag, yeah, that's yeah, it, yeah. yeah. And specifically, it's called interference drag. Yeah. So it's you, the interference you get over flow over two surfaces interacting and causing like a secondary effect. So putting a fillet like this minimizes that. You can see there's one on the wing or the wing the fuselage mm -hmm. here as well. So almost all airplanes have something like this. Yeah. Not all, but but many. Because something like this, again, it doesn't have much weight, doesn't have much complexity, and it, it greatly reduces the drag. When you finally got this into the air, what were some of the things that caught you out and thought, 
oh crap, we got to, <laughs> we got to look at that. Because on everything, there's going to be that moment where you think you've got it just mm -hmm. about right. What were the surprises the the first test and the first production aircraft threw at you? Yeah, the, I mean, the, the first one, um, probably the biggest challenge we had, and we kind of knew this before we flew it, because mm -hmm. a lot of times as you as you build, you know, building the first airplane takes like nine or 12 months, and yep. you kind of get the design done, or at least mostly done, because you're always still tweaking it, and you start build, and then you keep working, right? <laughs> so little things are like, oh yeah, we need to fix that eventually. Like, is it safe? Okay, it's fine, but we need to fix it eventually. So we had a long list of things at that stage, and all airplanes do. Probably the biggest one that we ended up kind of scrapping and starting over on is the, the control system inside, so the connection connections from the pilot stick you know to the the rudder and the ailerons and the elevator it worked it, it it flew it was safe but it wasn't certifiable we were a very young team that was doing it at the time i was um 24 and i was one of the oldest people on the team so <laughs> you know a lot of inexperience on that team um yeah. myself included and so yeah we learned a lot on that first airplane made some tweaks and and every airplane we built got better so that was probably the biggest one. Um, the other one that really challenged this airplane the whole time, which is also a very common story in airplane development, is weight. Mm -hmm. um, so we were moving really fast and getting the weight out and moving fast don't go hand in yeah. hand because it takes a lot of effort to reduce weight. And so this plane was always overweight. Um, and that was really, I mean, well, in the well, end. Oh, sorry, sorry. sorry to interrupt, I'm just gonna jump in there. To the layman, again, you think carbon fiber, you think Formula One, Yeah. shave it all off, it's going there. Where is the weight coming from in this area? What was the sort of target and how far off were, it, were you with it? <sighs> yeah, we remember numbers. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, we were probably, so I think the empty weight originally was supposed to be around 4,000 pounds and mm -hmm. we were somewhere around 5,000, so we we're off by 20%, which is a lot. Yeah. Um, and so, yes, you're right, carbon fiber can be very light, but it's all just how you design it. And so the problem with moving fast is, you, you have to ensure safety. So you don't want to cut corners and make things too thin and, and not strong enough. And when you're moving fast, you don't have time to fully optimize and to fully test things. Testing things is really where you, you get to the real answer. So mm -hmm. eventually we took you know wings and tails, put them in a static test rig and broke them you know, on the ground, not in flight, yeah. to see exactly how strong it is. And if it's stronger than it needs to be, okay, then remove some material. Yeah. We did not have time to do that before we first got in the air. So everything gets done with what's called an extra margin of safety, meaning you're making it a little stronger than you think it needs to be, but you just, you want that assurance. Yeah. So the plan was always, okay, eventually we'll slow down, we'll get the weight out of it and we'll solve it, which is what a lot of programs do. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately for us, we got to a point where we really needed to get to market for funding reasons and others. And a decision was made of, you know what, it's overweight, just ship it people will still buy it, which there's some truth to that. You know, it could have been a much better airplane. We could have sold even more, but the initial push was get it out even if it's overweight because there's still a market for that airplane. Mm -hmm. And how did it sell? We had a lot of orders for it. Um, our, our real problem in the company, by about 2007, we were ready to start rolling them off the assembly line and selling. We were certified. We were ready to start just cranking them out. Ah, 2007. <laughs> yeah, you see what's coming. Yeah. So I so recession obviously yeah. coming. That was ultimately what what shut the company down, forced into bankruptcy. Mm -hmm. However, that's not the whole problem. Like it, it's not that simple. It's not that simple, <laughs> right? The real problem was we could not deliver the airplanes at a profit. We could build them. They were taking many, many more times uh, labor hours to build than they were supposed to. Okay. Um, and that's always true on airplanes as well. There's what's called a learning curve. The yeah. first one you build is a lot slower than the 10th or the 100th. Mm -hmm. And But we were very slowly climbing down that curve. Had we had enough runway to stay in business for I don't know, two or three years and get 50 or 100 of them out the door, I think we could have gotten there. And we were making a lot of changes to the manufacturing system at the time to do that. But then unfortunately, the, the money ran out because of the recession before it got to that point. So in total, I think 17 of these were built and flown. This is serial number four, which was technically the first certified um, version, which has had a standard airworthiness from the FAA. Um, and then all the ones after that, so five through 17 were all in that Okay. In, in that category. There's a couple of these that are still flying. Um, most of them have, have not, are not flown anymore, but there's a couple in private hands that are still flying. How do you look back on it? Because, you know, you, you, we're, we're, we're not looking at you know, a grand success in a commercial sure. sense, but for you as a young engineer, yep. from a clean piece of paper design. Yep. Yeah, I, I look it? back on it fondly and for a couple reasons. One is, this really was my first real project from beginning to end. And so be able to see all of those stages. So initial concept, development, first flight, certification, and getting it into early production 
like, that was a really cool kind of whole set of events to see on one project like beginning to end. So that was that was great. And then all the things that go along with that. So all of the the learnings on the, like the new skills I picked up and so forth. So that's probably number one. Um, number two was just the team. You know, so we went through. Like I said, I was employee number three. When it shut down, we had 800 people, and so I was involved in building that team. A, you know, a and, true startup. Yeah, a yeah. true startup. Yeah. And and like there's dozens of people that still today that I either work with still or talk to on a frequent basis from that original team. And so, and, and airplane projects tend to do that. It's kind of a there's a camaraderie that comes out of it. It's it's you know there's tough times, there's hard times, there's a lot of frustrations, but there's successes as well. And you all kind of. You're like this band of brothers that are ancestors, of course, yeah. that come out of it um, when you get out with a lot of scar tissue, but a lot of good mm -hmm. memories as well. So, do your later aircraft still have cooling issues? I actually haven't. I guess there's only one other uh, <laughs> piston-powered airplane I've worked on, and that one did have cooling issues. <laughs> I, I was not involved in the cooling of that one, but yes, almost all piston-powered airplanes have cooling issues well, of you're, some sort, just like weight. Yeah, you're you're in good company. <laughs> what was it, John Bernard? Never made a racing car that had enough cooling on it because yeah. the cooling slowed it down. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> yep. And the thing about cooling is generally when you build the first airplane, cooling is probably not going to end in a bad day. Yeah. Um, it, it might, but probably not. Whereas the wing braking, that's a bad day. Yeah. So you don't put as much margin into cooling for that reason. <laughs> this has been great. Thanks for showing us around, Joe. And we'll have a look at some other things as well. Yeah, sounds great. I can't thank Joe Wilding enough for joining us on the Damcasters and he's going to be back because we recorded a few things with him while we were there at Pima. So, as always, thank you ever so much to the fabulous Pima Air and Space Museum for their continued support of the pod. And, of course, you can support the pod too and become a damn castier. Now, if I reach over here, we will have lovely things like stickers and we've also got the very own I'm a damn castier sticker. But what we also have is this wadge of postcards as well, which I will be sending out. Now, ironically, I have just grabbed Spitfire ones because Spitfires, but there are also things like Mustangs and somewhere in that pile, there is even Tempests. You get a handwritten card from me. All of that comes to a grand total of about three pounds a month at the bottom tier. So check the link in the description below for all of that. Be sure to give Joe a follow and check out what's going on at the Pima Air and Space Museum. They've got lots of stuff coming up and we've got some fun videos coming up with them as well. So until next time, thank you ever so much for watching. Hit the like and subscribe, do all that good stuff. But until next time, Take care of yourselves. Bye-bye. The Damcasters is hosted and produced by Matt Bone and is a Bony Abroad podcast production. To learn more about our podcast and check out our previous episodes, head to www.thedamcasterspod.com.